Members of the panel, let's proceed to our first quotation. <laughs> Two long playing records and a current book goes to Mrs. A.C. Reed of Victoria, British Columbia for the following. See if you can identify the author. There are countries so underdeveloped today that the gift of independence is like the gift of a razor to a child. Let me repeat that. There are countries so underdeveloped today that the gift of independence is like the gift of a razor to a child. Who said it? Oh, that would, uh, <clears throat> that sounds like, uh, uh, Cranburn. Cranburn? No, Mr. Callahan. Our author says that he has more trouble giving away money than making it, and he's made a great deal. Does this tell you anything about him? Uh, getting a peerage has been a great ambition in his life, and he managed to achieve it before he was 38, when he was 38. Oh, a Lord Beaverbrook? Lord Beaverbrook. That gave it away, sure, didn't it? certainly it? did. Well, uh, uh, is, is he the idiot that uh, made that statement? Is about he the idiotic? Oh, absolutely idiotic. But uh, I would not expect uh, anything better from Lord Beaverbrook. Mr. Dewhurst. Oh, I don't know. I don't agree at all, Ben. I think it's absolutely true. There, in fact, there are so few countries that have, having been given so-called independence, that know how to use it, that if you look at Africa, or particularly the Middle East, you find them almost all now ruled by cliques of colonels. And everyone knows that a colonel uh, is a fool, and therefore they, they're paying for their folly. You see, the only well, difficulty with that, just a minute there, Brandon, I want well, to have a The real interest that you would have in it is that there are a great number of people in England who leave very dull suburbs. And they're, uh, uh, they uh, lead a, a rather a dull and rather mean existence. They eat horrible food. They eat a uh, sort of a toad in the hole and glad to get it. And they suddenly arrive in, in Africa and in India and they uh, get themselves very good jobs. And through the power of arms and armament, and by no other power or by no other right, they, they, the British in Africa are just the same as the Germans in uh, Poland or in uh, Czechoslovakia. Mr. Oh, Callahan, Callahan, and then, then Mr. Just a minute now. Uh, the difficulty no, about on. this business of a nation not being ready for independence yeah usually means that the decision is in the hands of somebody else, you see, not in the hands of the people. Now, when you oh, say... Oh, I agree at all. Oh, no, 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 no. no, wait a minute. When you say so-and-so is not ready for independence, yeah. that means you think he's not ready. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. Now, that's all there is well, to it. And usually it's a possessor no, nation. A possessor no, no. nation. Brendan agrees with me that Aya, or Southern Ireland, was not ready I, for it, independence. I don't know... Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know... Excuse me. Uh, what do you mean by well, Southern Ireland? Southern now, before you answer, you Mr. Dewhurst, I, uh, um, well, really, I, I would say, Mr. Oh, uh, I would say, Mr. Uh, Dewhurst, that if you were attempting to speak French, that you would make an attempt. Je parle très bien that, that you would make, right, gentlemen, that you make gentlemen, an attempt. Gentlemen, to, to, gentlemen, Mr. Well, Mr. Name of no, Mr. B. In, in English, happens Mr. to be Bean. Ireland. Ireland. It's, uh, it's Mr. Olatunje. I have uh, so many. Uh, I've heard many people say the same thing, put the same quotation in many words. But I just want to know uh, who can tell me, uh, uh, who can tell, or uh, actually explain the yardstick of who is ready and when. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, this is most important. Uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, how long are they going to remain underdeveloped? Who helped them to remain underdeveloped? Or oh, there are so many imponderables. Well, I think that in a great many cases, although Mr. Bean won't agree with me, that it was the English that were responsible for leaving great civilizations behind them when they left. For instance, India. Um, you may say we ruled that with a rod of iron and so forth, but we didn't, in fact. We left a decent civil service, a decent army, different, decent foreign relations, friends. Mr. Nier is a friend of ours. The king and queen have been out there. What's wrong with India, Brendan? Well, uh, I would say about, about India that uh, in England itself, I would say, first of all, that uh, whose opinion do we usually get? Homespun philosophers like Beaver Brook, uh, uh, will put forward this type of shoddy, uh, the, the, this sort of shoddy thought, trust the man on the spot, the old China hand or the old African hand. What is the old African hand except 
some unfortunate fellow who was not able to make a living in England selling vacuum cleaners or something of the sort. But you keep getting back to England. Yeah, well, to uh, um, India. Um, Germany's colonies during the war, are, uh, the, uh, the country that Germany invaded, such as Poland and Czechoslovakia, she sent very nice Wimbledon types like uh, Eichmann. Uh, and uh, for the first time in their life, these people had servants. Now, I um, happen to like a certain cultivated, cynical society in London. I'm, uh, I don't uh, know um, whether you would be acquainted with uh, with any of the people I know there. <laughs> well, but, I think um, we inhabit the same area. I, I have a suspicion. But, uh, you you never go down the dark area? Uh, no, I, I, well, I, 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 sometimes, I sometimes go... Uh, aren't we? Aren't we really? <laughs> but the point, the point, well, the the point of the matter is that you're supposed to... This, this statement by uh, um, Beaverbrook. Beaverbrook about uh, when a nation is ready for independence Naturally, the Germans said the Poles shouldn't have their independence. Uh, naturally, the English in, uh, and also some, uh, some Irish people in uh, Africa, they say that all oh, the natives are not ready for independence yet. But they have always said, uh, every, every imperialist country has, uh, has no, always said... Agree, no, Mr. Some... Callahan and then Mr. Olatunja. Uh, look, I'm not interested in what you boys did in London. You know, or whether you no, inhabit the same I. area or not. The question is, does uh, an imperial power, possessing power, ever do anything for a country? Yeah. And I doubt very much that there's any record of it ever having done so. Well, what did the Romans and the Greeks do? Well, the, Ro the, Ro the, the Romans, uh, when, when the Roman power withdrew, the, yeah. the countries all fell to pieces. That's what they did for the individual countries. Well, when, when they left England, what happened when the Romans left? The, the point is that there's practically the, the, uh, the uh, civilization, whatever it was, the, the, uh, there was in England, collapsed. Well, the, the highways, uh, grass grew over the highways all across Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire. The, the thing is that the, the job of every occupying power is to see that the people do not develop a spirit of independence. Yes. Why did Caesar keep going into Gaul? He licked the Gauls again and again and again, and he was always back licking them. To back Mr. O'Connor up, I simply like to draw up an analogy. It's just like uh, when a child is being born. Regardless of who is the father or the mother, if this baby is not taken care of, if he's not given milk, if he's not given shelter, if he's not taken care of, probably by force of circumstances, either by nature or some other way, this child probably will die. He probably will have become any great writer, any great president, or any great military man, as we know in history. So this analogy fits into the position of these great powers in many other places. Are they really, or did they have the intention of preparing people, these people for independence, whether it's in Africa, Asia, or India? So we found out in history that that wasn't the end, uh, because in the early 17th centuries, when the... Uh, most of these people went to many African countries. It was just trade that took, brought them in. And they found it a federal land, and uh, it was economically kept the same, and uh, behind times. So, so, I think say, first of, first so of I'm all, saying that we are 500 years behind. First of all, they sent the uh, missionary, and with any luck at all, somebody had hit him a a blow of a knob carry or something, and they could afford them to send in the army after them. But imperialism is, uh, is um, it's a business. It's, it's the business of acquiring money. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, people don't take over other people's countries with the intentions of doing the inhabitants of those countries. Well, some of them good. Good. Because some oh, no, of them are ordered by the League. Some of them were no. ordered to by the League of Nations to become mandatory countries, for instance. Yeah, well, they are the gentlemen, you're all talking at Surely once. no one believes that a one country goes into another country to bring civilization to it or to improve the souls yes. of yes. the people or put Mother Hubbards on the women. That is not why they it do it. And if you start down. with that, 
that supposition, the whole thing becomes so false and hypocritical that practically no use for saying this. No, it isn't true. Let's get back to Tunji's argument. I, I maintain there are three degrees of bringing a new country to civilization. One is the way that the English have tried to do, sometimes successfully like in India, sometimes not quite so successfully. Next you get to a situation like the Congo, where the Belgians did not um, really try to leave behind a decent civil service, they sheared out of the country and they left behind, as your quotation says, Nathan, a razor, and we're suffering from these razor storms now. And there's a third category, those which have no intention of leaving behind a civil service or people who can govern themselves, such as the Portuguese in Angola, or even possibly, later on we may hear the same thing in South Africa. I don't think the natives there are even being the owners, shall I say, of the ground, are even being taught how to govern themselves because the ruling clique or class does not intend that they shall ever own that country. So there are three distinct categories. Do you really believe that there are certain nations in this world that are sort of called upon by God to uplift weaker nations? I wouldn't go as far as that. They sometimes <laughs> call upon the League of Nations or the United Nations, and I agree they are And sometimes God. they don't wait to hear the call from the United Nations. They go in there with gunboats and yes. planes a little ahead of them. The right? Russians are exactly yeah. doing well, that uh, now. They yeah. are the new imperialists, well, precisely. Right. You, have now, you're, you have now a villain you can see as yes, an imperial villain. Yeah. You can see the Russian as the imperial That's villain. That's right. But this is a very recent event in history that Russia has become such an aggressive imperial power. Well, there were other powers just as aggressive years, uh, uh, 25, 20 years, 10 years ago. That's right. Sorry. But let us look at the new one. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, did you ever hear of um, Amritsar in India? Yeah. Did you ever hear of a man called Michael Dwyer? No. Well, uh, Michael Dwyer was shot in the... Uh, was he Irish? Caxton Hall. Was he Irish? I shouldn't be at all surprised, but he was... He was... Uh, <laughs> He was a British general, and he, he uh, under his orders, his soldiers in the year 1919 massacred 400 people at a place called Amritsar, mm -hmm. which is in India. Mm -hmm. While well, I, uh, I, I would like rate. to know, small, it? it's a very small reduction of the birth rate, only 400 people. Well, yeah, but that's course, a very, very it's cynical it's remark. It is a cynical that's remark. That's an imperialist remark. remark. Right. It's a, it's a suburban sort of remark. You're a suburban yeah, fellow. Yeah, I come from suburban. Yeah, yeah you're, you're a suburban you fellow, and uh, it's a very, it's it's the sort of remark that, um, but that you would expect from Eichmann or, uh, or no, uh, somebody no, of that it's sort. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's a question of degree. He's quite right. The Southern Ireland is a suburb of England, so you get the same remark. Oh, no, it used to be. In all seriousness, say that that slaughter at Amritsar simply reduced the birth rate in India by 400. It's a very cynical remark. No, no because the way it was put forward was also cynical. Oh, no, no yes. That is a, was a there shame There have been riots on both sides. If you compare it with Eichmann, who killed six billion people, that's surely a better example. No, but your, your, your attitude, uh, thinking it's, some, it's, it's your feeble idea of a joke, but well, uh, 400 Indians are just as important in the sight of God as uh, 400 Englishmen. Are yes. What, are what the point surely is, gentlemen, what we are saying, what we are discussing is whether under any circumstances one country has the right to occupy another, and whether whatever the circumstances of departure are, any country has the right to remain when it's no longer wanted. And whether it leaves that country and leaves it in a perilous condition or not, it's whether it should get out. Isn't that surely the essence Look, of let the Let me make that myself is. perfectly clear well, on let this. Let Mr. Olatunji make himself clear first. And then first of all, uh, I'd like to give an example of what happened uh, in Guinea. When Guinea voted no to the Gulf Constitution, the only French colony that refused to be in the French community, the French took everything away. Everything. That means progress. Now Guinea has to start from the scratch. Now, if I'm the leader, I have to appeal to somebody to help. And a hungry man is a gullible man. This is what is happening in most of these places. Now, if the people have been sleeping giants, and now they are now trying to wake up from their lethargy, as some people call it, now, they should be given an opportunity at least to have a say in their own affairs. Well, I want to lay it down as a general principle that it's better to govern yourself badly 
and at least be governing yourself than to be well governed by someone who takes you in hand. Yes, we agree. Well, then and if that, we agree on that, there's no further we argument. We certainly agree, but uh, um, the point I'm trying to make is that England may have been an imperial power for one reason or another, though in fact the wars that she undertook to acquire real estate were very small indeed in number. But she has given up about 600 million people and virtually um, what is left is joined by a common band in the Commonwealth because people want it. But there has a new imperialist power has set up. Um, I don't know whose friends they are, but the communists have taken over uh, two or three hundred million people and are taking the position that England had a long time ago in much worse circumstances because you will never break away from communism. You can break away from what the Commonwealth like South Africa, but you what can't break get do? away from the Soviet Union. I don't Union. follow this. No, what does co uh, the introduction of communism do this? Why are you so sensitive? And what is your rheumatism with you? Yes, why are you so sensitive about England? I there haven't many, said anything about it. There are many forms of uh, imperialism. We don't have to... Uh, some are good and some are bad. Some, we don't, don't have to think, limit this to England. I don't think any England. imperialism is good. No, neither do I. Any form of it? No, we don't hold any imperialism. We don't hold... I, I um, agree with Mr. Callaghan that it's better for a country to govern itself badly even than be governed well by somebody else. But like the question, the Congo. But the question doesn't arise. Well, in the, in the, in the case of the Congo, the, not uh, the, the Belgians had a most vile history in the in the Congo, which uh, which everybody to, uh, from the time of the the, the, uh, the used to cut hands off uh, people. What do you call uh, it? Royal history. In the, uh, no, oh yes, <laughs> in a dreadful history. So so much so that I almost agree with the the uh, the Belgians have acted so badly in the uh, Congo that. It almost leads one to agree with Verlaine, who said, that, although, it, of course, it's another form of racial prejudice, when he said that a Belgian, when he's drunk, thinks he's behaving like a beast, but he's only doing certain injustice, he's only behaving like a Belgian. Here's a quotation sent in by Mr. Ray Anderson of Rainier, Minnesota. It goes as follows. See if you can identify the author. The Irish are the crybabies of the Western world. The uh, Irish are the crybabies of the know, Western let think, world. Let me think now. Well, the literati oh, went for his sports stories, and that made his reputation. Yeah? Uh, Hemingway, no? no? Hemingway, no, but you're no. in the right country, Mr. Bean. Uh, An unruly liberal columnist who altered his opinions on middle age. Mankin. No, no, this might no, be Westbrook Pegler. No, but that's <coughs> a very good guess. Our, our author took up painting. I don't think Pegler has ever taken up painting, no. has he? He once produced it and act, produced and acted in his own musical comedy, named after one of his columns. Oh, the column was called uh, the, the musical was called "Shoot the Works." Haywood Bruin, hey, well, the founder yeah. of the newspaper. Well, I know. <laughs> I, I know. I know a worse quotation with the artist than that. Bismarck, uh, at a time when the uh, the British royal family and the German royal family are very naturally very close, but all they're, they're kind of related. And Beaver Brook did perform one service. He, uh, to the public, he told them that the, he put, he got facsimiles of the signatures of members of the British royal family in Germany, where they were, where they used their German titles. But however, Bismarck was very, uh, he was annoyed by the Irish because they were annoying the English. And he said, he said, uh, if the Irish, if the Dutch had Ireland, there would be a garden. If the Irish had Holland, they would all drown. <laughs> Mr. Callahan, how about this quotation? <laughs> about the Irish being crybabies? The, cry, the, cry the crybabies. The crybabies of the Western world. Crybabies. Well, I don't. Uh, <clears throat> the Irish ha are given over in America to doing a little weeping. You know, the curious thing about Ireland, Brendan, you would notice is I passed through Ireland once on the way back from Paris, and I got a shock. <clears throat> the Garda, you know, the, the civil the police, police, the yes. police, they were all hard-faced guys. I didn't see any of this peculiar kind of crybaby stuff actually in Ireland that you get in the American, no. in the American Irish. So I think that Haywood Brune's no, uh, knowledge of the Irish was probably based on his knowledge of the Irish... Uh, uh, Americans, mm. but you see, a, a country. You must remember this about the Ireland, uh, the Irish. They had to cry to maintain their national identity. They were a country that was oppressed for nine hundred years, 
And a lot of their, of, of their melancholy had to go into their songs in order to maintain their national identity, in order to live, in order to be Irish. Don't you think perhaps they want to be oppressed? There are also... Oh, come on, cut well, that nonsense. Well, I mean, I are, don't call this... I don't there, even call this cynicism are anymore. It's just simple idiots. No, there are <laughs> Mr. Callahan, Mr. Dewars, go ahead. There, there are certain people in the world who enjoy oppression. I'm not going to uh, go to too far in this or say where, but there are such people. And uh, you what? should have got a job in the SS. Well, well, it wouldn't have been a bad day, paid one, but... Um, well, no, and that's well, the main thing. Gentlemen, they, gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. They complain of the black, black and tans, and they play, uh, complain of Cromwell, and I think they're right to do so. But the trouble with the Irish is that they've got such long memories. If England had long memories of people who persecuted them and fought them, then uh, we wouldn't even be talking to the West Germans or the allies on the other side at all now. But as I say, the trouble with the Irish is they are most likable people, but they have most long memories. And uh, so these days... Wrong with that? Well, these days... Yes, I think there is a lot wrong with it. It's not necessary any memory? longer. Well, you, you know, Mr. Bain, and Mr. Olatunji, is there anything wrong with having long memories? Yes, I think it's very, very dangerous to have memories from one war to another. God knows where we'd be if we uh, looked back half a dozen wars. We wouldn't be friends with anyone in the world now, <coughs> but we are. You know, there's a peculiar pattern of thinking, uh, Mr. Dewhurst, that you're giving here. A little while ago, you thought there were some nations, you see, that had a special... Uh, no, right, or a special call. No, you put that into my hands. All right, you thought there were certain undeveloped lands that needed the kindly touch, you see, of a possessing power. Now you also think there's certain undeveloped, let us say, cultural lands mm -hmm. that, that, need, uh, that need a little looking after, you see, uh, uh, too, that want to be... They want to be oppressed. The people no, want to be oppressed. This is a very peculiar and dangerous that, way of that, thinking. Uh, no, that remember oppression more than... You uh, said others. want to be oppressed. Mr. Bean. Well, you see, the position to get back to the original quotation, which was a rather shoddy product of a rather shoddy mind. Uh, luckily, Beaver Brook doesn't write his own papers. He's got well, this was Mr. More... Bruin. This was not... Oh, oh the, was cry the, the cry baby. The cry Oh, the cry baby one. Well, uh, the Irish in Ireland are very concerned with... Uh, all sorts of things. They have. They uh, if they get a letter with a harp on it, they uh, their, their emotions are stirred because it's an income tax demand, and uh, they um, they're mostly. I, I don't see them. Mr. B, I'm sorry. Our time is up. <laughs>